In 1965, sci-fi writer Frank Herbert wrote the sprawling science fiction novel Dune. The original story covers over 400 pages and was a big success. It won a Hugo and a Nebula Award. Set in the year 10191, Dune follows warring factions of noble families out to control the planet Arrakis, while protecting the source of Melange, an invaluable spice mixture that provides prophetic time travel. Hello and welcome to the channel. Today we're bringing you some did you know facts about the first Dune movie. So, let's get started. Prior to David Lynch taking the job, Ridley Scott was slated to direct the big screen adaptation of Dune. He was hired by producer Dino De Laurentiis after securing the rights to Herbert's novel in 1976. But after spending seven months on the project with writer Randy Wurlitzer and set designer H.R. Geiger, with plans to divide the story into two feature films, Scott wanted to start working as soon as possible, but Dune would take far too long to reach production. Scott decided to leave the project in favor of Blade Runner, which was ready to start production immediately. Made in Mexico Dune presented a massive logistical challenge for Lynch and his crew. In order to cut costs, the film was shot in various locations throughout Mexico. Roughly 1,700 crew members were on hand for the use of 80 film sets built on 16 different sound stages. To make the location perfect for shooting, 200 workers spent two months hand clearing three square miles of Mexican desert. It took over six years to make, and David Lynch worked on it for three and a half years. Churro Busco Studios in Mexico City was selected as the shooting location due to the nearby desert and devaluation of the peso making it possible to shoot the film for a quarter of what it would have cost in the U.S. Unfortunately, with that cut rate cost came cockroach infestations, Mexico's Byzantine bureaucracy, blackouts that necessitated having backup generators on hand at all times, a primitive phone network with only one direct line to the production office, worse smog than Los Angeles, and Montezuma's Avenge afflicting half the Europeans on the crew. In addition, Francisca Annis accidentally blew herself up with a gas oven and was hospitalized for several weeks. Production began in March 1983 and took six months to complete due to all the problems the production faced. Used Body Bags Dune has no shortage of memorable visuals and alien iconography. One of the more memorable costumes includes the large black bodysuits worn by the guild members. They were made from real body bags from the 1920s found in an abandoned firehouse by the production team. Stranger yet, Lynch and his team did not tell the actors that the body bags had been used several times to hold actual dead people until production wrapped. A Film in Trouble According to IndieWire, the actress from Lynch's Dune, Francesca Annis, revealed that after hearing the first sentences of the film, it was already clear to her that it would turn out badly. I'll tell you, when I first went to see the film at the premiere, and I've only seen it once, as soon as Princess Irulan started to talk in voiceover at the beginning, explaining the story, I thought, uh-oh, this film is in trouble. Any Hollywood film that has to explain itself in detail at the beginning is in trouble, she added. The Story of Moses The movie alludes strongly to Bible stories. Patrick Stewart's character, Gurney Halleck, actually gives two quotations that are from the Old Testament of the Bible. The first, Behold, as a wild ass in the desert I go forth to my work, which he says as they arrive on Arrakis. And, They shall come all for violence, their faces shall sup as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity of the sand. Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of the human mind. In Herbert's original Dune timeline, he briefly describes how artificial intelligence and all other thinking machines were wiped out in a series of devastating wars called the Butlerian Jihad. The original Dune novels explain that the fighting started because of an ideological division between two factions of humanity, one that had come to rely on the thinking machines for most aspects of life, and one that believed doing so was inherently harmful to the human race. The latter group ultimately won, leading to the destruction of all thinking machines. In the absence of computers and thinking machines, the Dune universe is populated by humans with enhanced capabilities, also known as Mentats. They are used extensively by the Great Houses, primarily as political advisors. Thanks to their vast memories and ability to organize huge amounts of data, they often provided valuable insights that would otherwise be lost. 
The ability to become a mentat is a talent limited to a small number of people. Thus, those with the discipline were prized in whatever role they choose. Sandworms of Dune The sandworms in Dune were inspired by the dragons of European mythology that guard some sort of treasure. Favorites of Frank Herbert included the dragon in Beowulf that guarded a hoard of gold in the cave, and the dragon of Colchis that guarded the golden fleece from Jason. Like these dragons, the sandworms of Arrakis will attack anyone who attempts to take the treasure that is spice from the desert sands. As if they were guarding it, the sandworms actually do not care for the spice as it is waste matter. In Children of Dune, a character even refers to sandworms as the dragon on the floor of the desert. Sandworms are attracted to rhythmic vibrations in the sand which they mistake for prey, mostly smaller sandworms. To escape the notice of the sandworms, a traveler in the desert must learn to walk without rhythm in a manner that simulates the natural sounds of the desert. This element comes from Frank Herbert's experience as a hunter and a fisherman. He knew how to mask his presence from prey by techniques such as approaching from downwind and treading lightly. Sandworms are described as incredibly tough by Leet Keens, who further notes that high-voltage electrical shock applied separately to each ring segment is the only known way to kill and preserve them. Atomics are the only explosive powerful enough to kill an entire worm, with conventional explosives being unfeasible as each ring segment has a life of its own. Water is poisonous to the worms but is in too short supply on Arrakis to be of use against any but the smallest of them. Emperor's New Clothes Sting's character, Feed Ruutha, was originally to have stepped out of the steam bath nude. Sting had agreed to shoot the scene, but the studio panicked and told the costume designers that they had to put something on him. The skimpy winged g-string he wore was made almost at the very last minute before the scene was about to be shot. Too painful to revisit. David Lynch repented doing the film as he had signed up despite knowing they wouldn't allow him to cut it the way he wanted, something that he perceived as selling out. He originally wanted to do a three-hour film, but requirements from the studio forced it to be trimmed down by one hour. Lynch has said he considers this movie the only real failure of his career. To this day, he refuses to talk about the production in great detail and has refused numerous offers to work on a special edition DVD. Lynch claims revisiting the movie would be too painful an experience to endure. Looking back, it's no one's fault but my own. I probably shouldn't have done that picture, but I saw tons and tons of possibilities for things I loved, and this was the structure to do them in. There was so much room to create a world, but I got strong indications from Raffaella and Dino De Laurentiis of what kind of film they expected, and I knew they didn't have final cut. Saved by a fan edit Lynch, wanting a three-hour cut of the film rather than the 136-minute version which hit cinemas, made editor Spice Diver to create the alternative edition, a combination of the theatrical cut, the extended TV version, and deleted scenes included on the home video release. At 178 minutes in length, it's far closer to the film Lynch seemingly wanted made, and has received universal praise from both fans of Frank Herbert's source material and those intrigued by Lynch's flawed original cut. By making the plot easier to understand, cleaning up dirty footage, and completing the blue eyes, Spice Diver has substantially reconfigured how Dune is presented to the audience, and the result is vastly superior to what landed in cinemas back in 1984. What other fun trivia facts do you know about Dune? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And if you enjoy this type of content, why not subscribe to our channel? Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again in our next video.